Hey friends, and welcome back to How Language Works. Emily here, your friendly neighborhood linguist. As you know, in this series, we unpack the foundational systems that underlie how language works. And in today's video, we're diving in to prosody. Okay, so let me start by asking you a question. What's the difference between the words entrance and entrance? They're the same sounds in the same order, but the difference is where we put the oomph in the word. But what specifically gives us that oomph feeling? Well, that has everything to do with prosody. And in today's video, we're diving into what prosody is, how it works, and you'll be able to identify the three main features that drive all of our prosodic structure. And as you're about to discover, there's a lot of information hiding in the melodic peaks and valleys of our everyday interactions. And in some languages, putting the wrong emphasis on the wrong syllable can actually change the meaning of the word entirely. Bonus points if you understood that movie reference. <laughs> you put the wrong emphasis on the wrong syllable. So without further ado, let's get to it. Okay, so what is prosody? Simply put, prosody is the aspect of language that gives prominence to certain pieces of words and phrases over others. As a result, people often call prosody the music of language because it's what gives the language its rhythm, its melody, its timing. Now, there are three main linguistic features that drive prosody in human language. They are loudness, pitch, and duration. Let's go back to that example of entrance versus entrance. How many syllables does each of those words have? Two. And for those of you out there wondering, what the heck is a syllable? It's essentially the smallest prosodic unit that we have, usually consists of a vowel and maybe a consonant or two, but it really depends on the language. In the simplest sense, syllables can be thought of as beats, and it's really easy to identify how many syllables are in a word by tapping your finger as you say the word slowly. For example, mango languages, entrance, entrance. Okay, so we know what a syllable is. Now, Entrance and entrance are both made up of the same phonetic segments, N, trance. So what changes is where we put the stress in the word. So how do we add stress to a desired syllable? Well, by applying those three linguistic features that we mentioned earlier, making it louder, making it higher in pitch, and making it longer in duration, or some combination of those features. And did you know those features aren't just subjective auditory perceptions? They're associated with measurable differences in acoustic properties. So loudness, for example, can be measured in decibels, pitch can be measured in hertz, and duration of a sound can be measured in seconds or on the more appropriate scale, milliseconds. It's important to note that these differences in loudness, pitch, and duration can happen at the word level, as is the case with entrance versus entrance, but we also apply these prosodic features at the sentence level, or as linguists call it, the intonational phrase. For instance, it's quite common to end declarative sentences with a falling tone and to end questions with a rising tone, right? See what I did there? Comedian Nikki Glasser has a funny example for how changing stress on an intonational phrase can change the meaning of the phrase entirely. The story goes that as a kid, her family would often change the stress on the phrase stay at home mom to stay at home mom, functionally changing a noun phrase describing an occupational lifestyle to a command telling their mother where she should stay. So stay at home mom and stay at home mom are composed of the same words in the same order. What changes is where we put the stress in the intonational phrase. In just a moment, we'll talk more about how this happens at the intonational phrase level. But before going there, let me say this. While the three main prosodic features, do you remember what they were? Loudness, pitch, and duration. While those three prosodic features can fluctuate independently, there are some known correlations that we should know about. Try this, say your name at a normal conversational sound level, and now scream it as loud as you can. You probably noticed that your pitch probably increased when you yelled your name. And this is because louder sounds tend to correlate with higher pitch. Who knew? Linguist did. Okay, 
So now we know what prosody is and the three key features that we use to make prosodic structure. But why do we use prosody? I like to think of it like this. There are three different paths by which we get the prosodic structures in our speech that we have. Sometimes we sprinkle it on top of our language for an added emphasis or effect. Sometimes it's actually baked into the very recipe for our language. And there are parts of our prosody yet that are merely natural byproducts of the language's underlying syllable structure. Let's take each of those three paths one by one. Path number one is we sprinkle prosody on top of our language for an added emphasis or effect. When do we do this and why? Well, as we mentioned earlier, we often use intonational stress to demarcate syntactic boundaries in our sentences. This means that we basically use stress in pauses to outline how the words in our sentences should be chunked together. That's how we get the difference between phrases like stay at home mom and stay at home mom. We also use prosody to express things like jokes, sarcasm, irony, and also emotional states. Think of how different it sounds when I say, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. In fact, prosody is one of the most sorely missed pieces of linguistic information when it comes to email correspondence and text messaging. That's why we try to end up replicating spoken prosody with things like extra exclamation points, writing okay with 15 A's, or writing an email in all caps. Emojis help too, but that is a whole other episode. And finally, we sprinkle prosody on top of our language in order to add context, texture, and effect. But what does it mean for a prosody to be baked within the recipe of a language? That brings us to path number two. Unbeknownst to some language speakers, there are a ton of languages for which the prosodic feature of pitch is actually meaningfully contrastive. Yes, we are talking about tonal languages like Mandarin Chinese or Hausa, a Nigerian language. So what is a tonal language? It's a language for which tone, that is distinct variations in pitch, within a word can change the word's meaning or its grammatical function. Fun fact, most tonal languages have between two to three different tones. Some have up to five. Now there are two main types of tone that I wanna talk about. Word stress, which linguists call lexical stress, and grammatical stress. So I'll talk about each one of those now. Let's talk about word tone first. Word tone changes the meaning of a word completely. For example, in Mandarin, when you pronounce ma with a high level tone, it means mother. But if you pronounce with a high falling tone, ma, it means scold. The closest thing we have to this in English is kind of like the difference between entrance and entrance. But it's not the same because pitch isn't the only way that we can measure stress in English. And we can test this because if I say entrance and entrance, they're both entrance. You know both of those meanings has to do with the entrance of a door. It doesn't matter where my pitch went, we just needed to know that the stress was on the first syllable. In other words, in English, we're able to employ other prosodic features like loudness and duration of the syllable in order to add stress to a particular symbol. But in tonal languages like Mandarin, that distinction of pitch is actually baked into the vocabulary. Okay, now grammatical tone. This is less common than word tone, but Igbo, also a Nigerian language, is a perfect example of it. In Igbo, if you want to say jaw, you say it with a low tone, but if you want to indicate it in its grammatical possessive form, meaning, for example, a monkey's jaw, you don't say monkey's jaw, you just say jaw with a high tone. And that high tone is what indicates it's in the possessive form. So this would kind of be like, instead of saying monkey's jaw, you would say monkey jaw, and that indicates the possessive. Cool, right? Okay, so now we've learned the prosody can be optionally sprinkled in to add emphasis and context, and it can be baked into a language as is evidenced by tonal languages, but that's not the whole picture for prosody. A language's overall prosodic rhythm or timing is often nothing more than a mere byproduct of its underlying syllable structure. For example, in Hawaiian, almost every single word has the same syllabic structure. It's got a consonant followed by a vowel 
consonant, vowel, consonant, vowel. Very predictable, very regular. Each syllable tends to have pretty much the same length, which gives it a pretty easy, regular cadence. <laughs> But English, for example, is not like this. In English, we love consonant clusters and diphthongs. Consonant clusters mean two or more consonants adjacent to one another, so like the word sixth. Or in diphthongs mean two or more vowels adjacent to one another. For example, the word right. Because English doesn't have this predictable and regular consonant, vowel, consonant, vowel, syllabic sequence, the timing of English is much less regular, and as a result, it carries a different prosody, a different melody. Well, there you have it. That is prosody in a nutshell. Since we covered a lot in today's episode, we're gonna do a little recap. Here are the three things that I want you to take away from today's video. First, prosody, often referred to as the music of language, is the aspect of language that gives prominence to certain syllables and words over others. The three main features of prosody that you should know are loudness, pitch, and duration. And typically the sounds that we perceive as being more prominent are louder, higher in pitch, and longer in duration. And finally, there are three reasons or explanations for why we have and use prosody. First, we can sprinkle it over our language, we can sprinkle it over our speech to add an additional context, texture, or emphasis. It can be baked into the recipe of our language, as is evidenced by tonal languages. And when it comes to the overall rhythmic timing of a language, typically prosody is a mere byproduct of the language's underlying syllable structure. Well, that is the end of the video. This was our ninth and final video for season one of How Language Works. If you haven't caught our previous videos, then go check them out. We talk about phonetics, phonology, syntax, morphology, all the good things. And if you like this video, then let us know by subscribing, liking, and comment down below. Oh, and I almost forgot. If you like taking quizzes and you're a lover of language, then check out the link that we dropped for you in the description. It's a quick and fun quiz that you can take to see if you understand prosody. Some of the questions are easy, some of them are tough, but I believe in you. Thanks for watching. And from me and the rest of the Mango Languages family, stay healthy, stay happy, and language on. Ciao.